before we begin this seventh lecture on the critique of pure reason, there are two important announcements that I wish to make. The first, as I indicated a week or two ago, is that there will be a week's hiatus in these lectures. Uh, this is the 17th of October, for those of you watching in real time. I won't be lecturing on the 24th. I will again be lecturing on the 31st of October. In the interim, as you know, I am going to Paris in my desperate effort to get, a, get away from the election. The second is, in many ways, to me at any rate, an even more important announcement. I mentioned in my last lecture, as I was explaining the idea of the reproduction and imagination according to a rule, the example of counting. And I mentioned that when I take my morning walk, I count buses along my route, and that on occasion, in exciting moments, I count eight buses. Well, on Friday, October 14th, I counted nine buses. And I mention this just so, as these lectures go up on YouTube for immortality, people years from now will look at them and know that Robert Paul Wolf, in 2016, on October 14th, walking on the Findlay Golf Course Road, saw nine buses. All right, that's, that's my most important announcement, and I'm tremendously, it made my whole day. I'm very <laughs> proud of that. We come now to a very important passage, the deduction of the pure concepts of understanding in the second edition. You will recall that this is one of two chapters of the critique that Kant completely rewrote from scratch for the second edition. However, before I launch into that, I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about something that I have several times alluded to and which I think is quite important. And I think we now have enough information about Kant so that I can make sense out of this. And that is the relationship bet between the doctrine of the critique of pure reason and Kant's ethical theory. I've several times indicated that I think there's a fundamental conflict between the two. And I've already suggested one of the ways in which I think that conflict arises. But today I want to talk about what I think is the most important way. Uh, let me say, by the way, I have written a book on Kant's ethical theory called The Autonomy of Reason, which is a commentary on the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. But that, what I'm going to say today is not contained in that book because actually it didn't occur to me until after that book had been written. I did write up these ideas in an essay called Remarks on the Relation of the Critique of Pure Reason to Kant's Ethical Theory, and I published it. But it was published in a, in a location so obscure that I suspect nobody has ever read it. It appeared in something called New Essays on Kant, which was published in 1987, and I would imagine that nobody has ever read it. So this is my shot at bringing attention to it. First of all, just to remind you, Kant had three principal writings in the area of ethical theory, aside from some interesting and important essays. Three books. The first was The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, which although it's very short, it's only 80 or 85 pages long, it is universally, I think, considered his most important writing on the subject. And I think it is generally considered to be one of the most important works on ethical theory ever written. His second uh, discussion of the subject was in the second of the three critiques, the critique of practical reason, which was published in 1788, just a year after the second edition of the critique came out. And although one would expect that the critique of practical reason would be as important for his ethical theory as the critique of pure reason was for his theoretical philosophy, in fact, it is a less challenging and less interesting book, at least in my opinion. The third of his three publications, which appeared quite late in his life, was published in 1797. Kant lived to be 80 years old, and he died in 1804, so that means he was 73 when he published it. Uh, Kant, by the way, I don't think I've mentioned this, Kant was something of a hypochondriac, and he, he thought he wouldn't live very long, which is one of the reasons cited by German scholars for the so-called patchwork theory of the, of, the, of the deduction and of the first critique. 
That is, when Kant was bringing the critique to conclusion, he was rushing because he thought he wouldn't live long enough to see it brought out, so he gathered stuff together very rapidly in 1780 and early 1781 and then published the critique. And he then went on after 1781 to live for another 23 years. At any rate, the metaphysics of morals is in many ways the least interesting of his ethical writings except that there are things in it, particularly in the part devoted to the theory of justice or of law, which I think can be drawn on to complete the argument of, that is developed in the groundwork of metaphysics of morals. That's a complicated subject I won't even go into today. Let's remind ourselves of the big picture. For Kant, the fundamental challenge that he faced in all of his philosophy was somehow to resolve the conflict between free will and determinism. Kant was, in science, a strict determinist following Newton. He, th he thought there was no wiggle room in the world of science for a little human freedom to squeeze in somewhere. What's more, he was convinced that it made the only way to make sense out of ethical judgments and out of the moral life was to understand human beings as rational moral agents who had free will, could choose freely what to do, could choose freely, more precisely, what principles to act upon. And that seemed to be incompatible with the determinism of Newton and of Newton's physics. So what Kant did, going all the way back to the inaugural dissertation, was to divide appearance from reality and to insist that Newtonian physics was a science of appearances. We've been through this at great length. Whereas ethical theory concerned human beings as things in themselves, as numinal agents, as he came to call them, as selves in themselves, acting freely, not under the constraints of Newton's laws. They acted in accordance with Newton's laws when a, when a free moral agent chose to do something in the realm of appearances, he or she had to act in such a way that what he or she did had consequences that were determined by Newton's laws. But Kant did not think that the choice was itself determined as Newton's physics would seem to uh, imply that it was. So the moral self on Kant's view is the self in itself in its function in practical reason. And according to Kant, the moral self has the capacity to act in accordance with the moral law, which Kant thought was a law of reason that was binding on all rational agents as such, not only human beings whose experience is shaped by space and time, but if there are such other beings whose forms of intuition are different from ours, and even, just hypothetically, angels purely spiritual creatures, any rational agent would be bound by the moral law because the moral law was a dictate of pure reason. And you will recall, I'm going to assume what I think is a fair assumption that anybody who has soldiered on all the way to this seventh lecture probably has enough engagement or encounter with Kant to be somewhat aware of Kant's ethical theory. And almost certainly that would mean having had some experience of the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. That is a work that is very widely read, very widely studied, much more so than the critique of practical reason and much, much more so than the metaphysics of morals. And so you will recall that in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, Kant offers four examples of the highest moral law, which he calls most famously the categorical imperative. I should just interrupt myself to explain something that frequently people don't quite understand. All rational agents as such are capable of apprehending and recognizing the universal a priori validity of the moral law. But there are some creatures, ourselves, who are both rational and non-rational. We are, if I can call the quote up from Alexander Pope's famous poem, The Essay on Man, 
we are creatures born to this isthmus of a middle state, rudely, why, ru rudely great, uh, God, darkly wise and rudely great. That is, we are both angels and devils. We are both rational and we are passional. And that is Kant's view of human beings, a very traditional view. On that view, we experience the commands of the moral law as a constraint upon us, as a command. We do not experience them simply as the dictates of pure reason, but as a constraint on what we desire to do, on our desires, on our passions. So we experience the moral law as an imperative, not a hypothetical imperative which says, if you want a certain thing, then you ought to do such and such, which will lead to that, but as a categorical imperative. Angels would not experience the moral law as a categorical imperative, any more than mathematicians experience the law of contradiction as a categorical imperative. There are, let us suppose, no mathematicians who say all A are B, all B are C, and then find themselves tempted to say some A are not C. But they know that they shouldn't say that because there is a categorical mathematical imperative, not to, a logical imperative not to say that. So tempted though they are to draw an irrational conclusion from the premises, their higher reason kicks in and they compel themselves to do what they know they ought to. That's not the way mathematicians and logicians behave. I'm not a logician or a mathematician, but I don't seem to remember when I was studying logic with Willard Van Orman Quine that he said, now, this is the moral imperative that you must obey. Instead, he just said, these are the laws of logic. Uh, so now, later on, you remember, we get a different version of the, of the moral law. He, first, he says, he gives us these examples. Then he says, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means only. This is a famous, famous formulation of the categorical imperative. It happens not to make any sense, but that's neither here nor there. It's really beautiful. So I think we should cherish it for what it is. But now we come to a problem. And this is the problem that I didn't understand when I was writing my book on the Kant's ethical theory, but which occurred to me later. The question is, how can I, a moral agent, ever meet another person, another moral agent, in the field of experience? Why is that a problem? Well, let me give you a hypothetical example. Suppose that you are taking a creative writing class. And the teacher in the creative writing class assigns the following uh, exercise for the next class. She says to the class, I want each of you to write a story about this class. And in that story, you can make the story about anything you wish, but in that story, each of the members of this class has to appear as a character in the story. It's a small class, there are only six people in it, so it's not a terrible lift for the students. You go off, she says, and write a story about this class in which all six of you appear as characters in the story. It can be a detective story, it can be a fantasy story, it can be a love story, but it has to have all six of you in it. And now everybody comes in at the next class with his or her story. Now think about it for a moment. Each of these, let's suppose that these stories are different, although they don't have to be different. By some miracle, without collaboration, they might all write identically the same story. Indeed, it might have all the same words in it. And let us, just to make life simple and not go into the depths of literary theory, assume that there's an omniscient narrator in all six of these stories. So in each one of these stories, let us suppose all the words are the same. But in each story, there is one character who is the appearance in the story of the author of the story. Now in Joe's story, the character in the story who is named Joe is the appearance of the author in that story. In Mary's story, the character in that story who's named Mary is the appearance of the author in that story. 
The stories, let us suppose by some wild accident, are identical so that uh, somebody outside the class reading them would not be able to tell which of the members of the class had written which story. They're all the same story, except that the relationship in each story of the character to the author is different because there is one character in the story who is the appearance in the story of the author. That, according to Kant, is the relationship between my noumenal self, my rational self, my transcendental ego, and the world. The world in which I appear as a character, among many other things. Because I am synthesizing the diversity of, of uh, intuitions into the world. And remember that According to Kant, the self is the lawgiver to nature. So it is the synthesizing ego, the synthesizing ego or transcendental ego or transcendental self, which is for theoretical purposes the, the same identical person as the moral self is for ethical purposes. It's the same noumenal self. So when I, in, in the story, if you can think of the, of the history of the universe as a story told by the transcendental ego, which is essentially what Kant is saying. He doesn't put it that way, but that is what he's saying. In that story of the universe, there is one character in the universe who is the appearance in the universe of the author of the story. Namely, in, my, in the story that I am telling, I am in that story the appearance in the world of the synthesizing ego. Now, my moral obligations are not to appearances, but to moral agents. I make a promise not to a tree or a rock. I make a promise to another person, another moral self. And I owe, I owe fidelity to that promise, not to myself alone, although Kant thinks I do, but to that person to whom I have made the promise. I have an obligation to tell the truth, not to myself when I'm talking to myself. I have an obligation, I have a, Kant thinks I have that obligation too, but that's not interesting. I have an obligation to tell the truth to another person whom I meet in the world. This is, this is always the problem, you understand, with science fiction stories. You go to a foreign planet and you encounter things and you don't know which of those things are moral agents and which are, which are the local trees and rocks. You don't know which are the persons. Now, in most science fiction movies, they just have big ears or they have funny colored skin, so it's easy to tell. They're usually bilaterally symmetric, which is the way mammals are in, in our world, but they could be something that you wouldn't even recognize as a person. But I can recognize myself as the appearance in the realm of appearances of myself. The problem is there is no logical way in which anyone else could appear as a as an author in my story, leaving aside poss the possibility that two students get together and decide to collaborate in writing the story, leaving aside joint authorship. And joint authorship, remember, is impossible for Kant because his whole argument is based on the unity of consciousness. And the unity of consciousness means there, are, there isn't joint authorship of the universe, there is sole authorship of the universe. The, the objective unity of causal unity of the universe is the objective reflection of the subjective unity of my consciousness. Which means there's no way that I could possibly encounter another noumenal agent in my realm of appearance. There's no way that in the story that I write there could be anybody else who is also the appearance in that story of another noumenal agent. Only I am the appearance in that story of a noumenal agent, namely myself, the author. And that, if you think about it, is a really impossible problem for Kant to get over. Notice that it's no problem for him so long as he is talking about theoretical philosophy because he doesn't really care whether there's one and only one author of Newton's laws in the universe. He doesn't care whether 
it is my mind that is the lawgiver to nature because he thinks, we've talked about this and I'll come back to it in a later lecture, he thinks that all of us have the same category. So he never worries about the possibility that the categories are themselves varied culturally or individually or historically from one synthesizing agent to another. So he doesn't have a problem. The problem doesn't crop up for him. What if one synthesizing ego is synthesizing one set of physical laws and another syn synthesizing ego is synthesizing another set of physical laws. So the problem doesn't bother him so far as it is a matter of theoretical philosophy of, of, of science and mathematics. But the problem is ungetoverable when he comes to ethical theory because it is noumenal agents, selves in themselves, rational selves, that bear obligations to one another and have duties to one another and owe one another the, the, to keep promises to tell the truth and to do all the other things that Kant thinks we have an obligation to do toward other agents. And there is no way that I can see that he can solve this problem. I don't think he ever realized it. I don't think it ever occurred to him. It didn't even occur, I mean, I had the benefit of reading what he'd written. It didn't occur to me until after I published a book on the subject. And he was writing the bloody stuff. So at any rate, that is as much as I'm going to say about that, because I'll, this is really supposed to be a lecture on the critique of pure reason. But think about it. It is, it is a problem that Kant scholars have not talked about, I think, this is purely biographical, biographical and autobiographical, because relatively few Kant scholars write both about Kant's ethics and about his theoretical philosophy. Relatively few of them write books both about the critique of pure reason and the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, and therefore they aren't thinking of both of these things simultaneously. But if you do think about them simultaneously, I think you will see that there is a simply irresoluble conflict and an insoluble problem in the relationship between his two theories, and I don't see any way that you can get around it. Okay, let's go back to the critique. We come now to the second edition deduction. Remember the situation. Kant wrote the first edition chapter in a hurry, we may suppose. But at any rate, it was a rather chaotic and not terribly well-organized production, although it was full of the most enormously important materials, which I've spent several lectures talking about. When he came to rewrite it for the second edition, quite obviously he felt himself that it was not a satisfactory exposition of his views because he threw out the first edition deduction entirely and starting from scratch wrote the second edition. The first thing you notice when you read the second edition deduction is that there's, there's no threefold synthesis. It has dropped out. Now, you remember what he said in the preface to the first edition. He was already uncomfortable about it. He said, because it was purely psychological, it was not essential, although as we shall see, it really is. He was, he was caught. He knew that it was essential, but on the other hand, he was uncomfortable with the fact that it was basically a psychological account of what the mind does. He was quite right about that. So what we find in the second edition deduction is a kind of nicely pulled together, very neatly organized and well expounded, rather high level exposition of Kant's philosophy in which he just floats above the problems, never tells you what synthesis really is, never gets beyond the metaphor of running through and holding together. But it all, it's so difficult and it's all so nicely written that it's easy not, not to notice that he's left out the crucial part. Let's take a look at how the argument goes. Kant starts right at the beginning. After the opening section, he says, the original synthetic unity of apperception. And now he says, it must be possible for the I think to accompany all my representations. That is his official starting point for the argument. That's where the argument starts. And when, I think two lectures from this one, when I finally go back to those fancy boards that I had Staples make up and put them up on an easel and go through the nine-step argument, 
the unity of consciousness will be the starting point. It will be the premise of the argument. And that is, Kant understands, the real premise. He then goes on to say something interesting, which is a, a necessary part of, what he, of what's implied by this, but which he hadn't said quite so clearly in the first edition deduction. What he says is, even analytic ju judgments require the synthetic unity of consciousness. Now, if you think about it, you realize that must be so. But he hadn't made that clear in the first edition. Here's what he says. I'm reading now from B133, and then I will read a little bit from the footnote to that. He says, only insofar as I can unite a manifold of given representations in one consciousness is it possible for me to represent to myself the identity of the consciousness in these representations. In other words, the analytic unity of apperception is possible only under the presupposition of a certain synthetic unity. And then he says in this long footnote at the end of it, the synthetic unity of apperception is therefore the high, that highest point to which we must ascribe all employment of the understanding, even the whole of logic and conformably therewith transcendental philosophy. Indeed, this faculty of apperception is the understanding itself. Now, what Kant is saying, and this is very important, is that all thought rests on the unity of consciousness. And therefore, even when I'm doing logic, which consists of nothing but analytic propositions, the propositions are analytic, but they rest upon the prior truth of the synthetic proposition that the I think attaches to all my representations. The synthetic unity of consciousness, synthetic unity of apperception, is the precondition for all thought, logic as well as physics. That is, even that thought which involves only the assertion of analytic propositions rests upon this synthetic unity of apperception. And now Kant goes on, he says, an understanding which through its self-consciousness could supply to itself the manifold of intuition, an understanding that is to say, through whose representation the objects of the represent representation should at the same time exist, would not require for the unity of consciousness a special act of synthesis of the manifold. He's talking here about a productive uh, consciousness, that is, God's consciousness. For the human understanding, however, which thinks only and does not intuit, that act is necessary. It is indeed the first principle of the human understanding and is so dis indispensable to it that we cannot form the least conception of any other possible understanding. And now he says something rather interesting and limited either of such as is itself intuitive, or of any that may possess an underlying mode of sensible intuition which is different in kind from that in space and time. Earlier, he seemed to suggest that what he was saying, certain part of what he was saying could apply, the categories could apply, to the intuition of a, of a being whose intuition was not spatio-temporal, but had some other form. Here, he says, we cannot even conceive that. And what's more, we certainly cannot conceive of God's intuition, which is a rational or creative or active intuition. You remember I talked about this several lectures, many lectures ago, in regard to Spinoza. That is, for God to think something is to create it. This is, by the way, contrary to Leibniz's view, which is that God first thinks of all the logically possible universes and then chooses the one that is best. Hence, in Voltaire's Candide, Dr. Pangloss says, all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. That's a kind of comic version of Leibniz's doctrine. The, print, the doctrine of sufficient reason, which is God considers all the possible worlds that he could create and chooses the one that he recognizes to be the best. Spinoza says not a bit of it. For God to conceive of a possible universe is to create it. There is no such thing as a gap between God's conceiving of a possible universe and God's creating it, because God's intuition is an active intuition. It is a creative intuition.
these are not matters of burning importance these days. They got people all riled up two or three hundred years ago. But just to sort things out, it's interesting to think about that. Now Kant goes on, again, in a way which we're familiar with, in a way that, in a sense, is an answer to Hume, to distinguish mere subje subjective association, a la Hume, from objective connection in an object. And here I'm reading from B141 and 2, two selections. First, Kant says, I, fi I find that a judgment is nothing but the manner in which given modes of knowledge are brought to the objective unity of apperception. Only in this way does there arise from this relation a judgment that is a relation which is objectively valid and so can be adequately distinguished from a relation of the same representations that would have only subjective validity, as when they are connected to, according to laws of association. You remember, law, and he, well, he says, he gives an example. In the latter case, all that I could say would be, if I support a body, I feel an impression of weight. I could not say, it the body is heavy. Thus, to say the body is heavy is not merely to state that two representations have always been conjoined in my per perception, how often that per however often that perception be repeated. What we are asserting is that they are combined in the object, no matter what the state of the subject may be, and therefore, of course, that in order to have truth, they must be associated in that way. Yeah? Okay. Um, you, you can put this question off if you Sorry, but um, it, it, in this passage, he, he's assuming that so we can have representations and they can be connected in a way which is merely a subjective connection, and they can be related to each other in a way that makes an objectively valid um, rep, uh, judgment. But whichever way they are, he calls them representations. And to a contemporary year, that makes it sound like they, they have content. There is something that they represent. Otherwise, they wouldn't be representations. But it seems that it's possible that Kant is not assuming that, but just because he calls them representations, maybe, maybe, maybe that doesn't imply that they actually represent something. Yeah. yeah. The question, I can't tell whether this mic pick, picked you up, so I'll repeat the question, even though it may be that it did perfectly well. Uh, the question concerns the Kant's use of the term representation, or in German, Vorstellung. And to a modern ear, the word representation seems to carry with it the implication of some objective significance. And here he seems to be talking about representations, whether or not they have rep uh, objective significance. I was going to mention this later on. I'm going to get to actually this subject a little bit later on, but I'll, I'll mention it now. There are certain, uh, different philosophers have different terms. Uh, for the most general term for cognitively significant or potentially cognitively significant contents of mind. Locke uses the term idea, and so he talks about the new way of ideas. Hume, in the very first sentence of the treatise, <coughs> uses the term perception and says there are two kinds of perceptions, impressions, and ideas. Kant's most general term is representation. This is simply so far just a this is so far just a terminological difference. But there is an implication which you're picking up on. Representations, as as Kant uses the term, are contents of the mind that a purport to have or could have or could play a role in our having knowledge of things. They could have referential significance. They are to be distinguished from certain contents of the mind that don't have representational significance, such as feelings of pleasure and pain, which although they are contents of the mind, do not even, do not even hypothetically have representational significance. A feeling of pleasure or pain, Kant thinks, is not even purportedly a representation uh, of something, doesn't have reference to something other than itself. Now, of course, the question is, under what conditions do these contents of the mind, that is to say spatio-temporal contents of the mind, succeed in referring to something other than themselves in the realm of appearance, and therefore have objective significance, and that's in a sense what the whole book is about. But 
he uses the term representation as the most general term to, uh, to cover any content of consciousness that purports to have or appears to have or could possibly have cognitive significance and could have lay a claim to knowledge. Does that make it so, so he's going to be able to say that there are some representations, the representation of a mirage, for example, that purports to have objective reference, but in fact doesn't. There is nothing that corresponds to it in the realm of appearances. But it purports to have, whereas a feeling of thirst that I have, which leads me, we may suppose, eventually to have a perception of a mirage, the feeling of thirst has no reference to anything other than itself. <coughs> now, I don't want to get into that whole discussion. That, that's a discussion on which one might disagree with Kant, but that's the way in which he's using the terms. So if we understand Vorstellung is meaning something like putative representation. Yes. Okay. It, it, it has the same general sense as perception for Hume or idea for Locke, and doesn't carry with it the implication that it is a successful uh, it, it, that it has se successful reference to something other than itself, only that it purports to. But it seems it does exclude a lot of things that Locke and Hume would include as ideas like feelings. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll have to talk a bit about that. Indeed, fairly soon I'm going to start talking about just a, 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 a complication in Kant's theory in which that will play a role. But remember, that, remember the, the sort of somewhat hokey reference I made to the medieval view of warm and, uh, warm and cold and wet and dry and so forth and that whole way of understanding things and the way in which the new science simply denied those sensory contents as having cognitive significance. It was only spatio-temporal uh, forms and relations that had cognitive significance. Kant thinks that feelings, as he calls them, gefühl, feelings do not, are not representations. That is, the, our, our feelings are, on his view, never mind whether this is true or not, that's a whole psychological subject I don't want to get into, but on his view, our feelings do not have even possible cognitive significance. They are not even putatively ref referring to something other than themselves. They are simply, now they will have to be, something will have to be said about them because we have them. And so we're going to have to say what they are and how we understand them. And of course, later on in Kant's philosophy, both in his ethical theory and in his aesthetic theory, they will crop up again and play an important role. They play no important role here, but they do play an important role later on. And he has a whole lot to say about them, which I don't even want to try to talk about because it's much too complicated and is not related to the critique of pure reason. At any rate, now he goes on. <laughs> Well, at this point, I want to do something that Kant does in the first edition deduction. Remember, at a certain point, after going through the threefold synthesis, abruptly he says, at this point, we must raise the question, uh, what is the object of representations? And it's not obvious why it comes at that point. Well, at this point, I want to raise a complication. It's not obvious where it comes from. It's a subject that Kant didn't adequately treat, although it seems to me clearly implied by what he said and compatible with what he said. And therefore, I want to spend some time talking about it. To put it in a phrase before I start plunging into it, what I'm talking about is the double nature of representations. Here's the, here's the story and here's the problem. My transcendental ego, whose consciousness is the transcendental unity of, of consciousness, my transcendental ego is the lawgiver to nature. What I do is I reproduce in imagination the diversity of perceptions that I have, and in so doing I impose upon them a categorical order which gives them scientific structure, as it were, which makes them into a, a world of objects, which we will go much more into this. But if you think about it for a minute, there's an, there's an odd problem here, because the very same representations, the very same spatio-temporal representations 
that are reproduced in imagination according to a rule and in so doing have imposed upon them a, stru a causal structure, those very same representations are also the contents of my mind. And when I say my mind, I mean Robert Paul Wolfe's mind. Now, Robert Paul Wolfe was born on December 27th, 1933. I know it's impossible to imagine anybody that old, but just give it to me for a moment. I was born in 1933, and I will die at some point, alas, not too many years in the future. Give me 10 or 15 years, even then, that's not much. But the world that, I have, that my transcendental ego has constructed is, according to physicists, six and a half billion years old. Robert Paul Wolfe lives on this little fourth planet from the sun, as the, in, in that TV show, in a middle-sized galaxy, which is one of apparently two billion galaxies, scientists have now decided. And yet, so all of those, all of those perceptions, which through being repro reproduced in imagination according to a rule, have organized all of this into the universe, are also the contents of my mind. My mind of the phenomenal object Robert Paul Wolfe, who is located at a particular time and a particular place in that construction. Every one of those contents of my mind therefore has a double role. It is both a representation of something other than itself, directly or indirectly a representation of everything in the universe. And it is also the contents of one particular empirical mind out of many, seven billion at the moment, alive on this planet, we may suppose, at this moment in time, and who knows how many going back, and who knows how many going forward, and who knows how many on other planets, in other solar systems, and other galaxies, if we are to believe Star Wars. All right, that's weird. But it is clearly implied by what Kant says, and it's compatible with what Kant says. But my, the contents of my consciousness have causes. My visual perceptions are caused by some interaction between the world and my sense organs, my eyes, which produces some electrical con current which flows to some portion of my brain and so forth and so on. All of my contents of consciousness are part of the causal order and, we, and they are regulated by and controlled by causal laws as much as anything else in the universe. Now what that means, Kant I think never quite realized this but it's clearly implied by everything he says, is that each one of the spatio-temporal perceptions which is reproduced in imagination according to a rule has to be reproduced twice according to two quite different rules. One is the rule that reproduces them in their role as representations of the phenomenal world thereby imposing on them the laws of nature as Kant tells us and the second way and the second time in which they must, must re be reproduced is the way in which they are reproduced to produce me. Me, particular Robert Paul Wolfe, here, now, right now, with my thoughts and my perceptions and my contents of consciousness. Because my contents of consciousness, as part of the phenomenal world, fit into the larger causal order, but they are also at the same time, as it were, the materials out of which the entire causal order is constructed. Now I think, we'll come back to this in the second analogy when this will be, in a sense, it'll come up again. I think that this is a, this is something that is compatible with what Kant has said. I think it is implied by what he said. I think it's complicated to spell it out. I don't think it contradicts it. This is not, this is not like the problem about the relationship between his ethical theory and his theoretical philosophy, where there is a contradiction that can't be resolved. It's just a complication which is rather strange when you think about it, but is perfectly compatible, in my view, with his theoretical philosophy. It just has to be unpacked and spelled out. Now, you say to yourself, wait a minute, this is weird. Once we start talking this way, are you telling me uh, to which I can answer like Tanto, what do you mean you? 
white man, and who's the you who's talking to me? Uh, but do I mean talking to myself? Let's put it that way, a la Descartes, who writes, Descartes writes his philosophy as, med as meditations, because of course a meditation is something that you, is, is a form of literary art in which you talk to yourself. And given Descartes' philosophy, there isn't anybody around that he can be sure exists except himself, so he talks to himself. Well, assume for a moment that I'm just talking to myself. Do I really mean talking to myself that the whole universe is constructed out of my perceptions? And then I say to myself, but what else could it be constructed out of? How how else could I have any knowledge of anything save through my perceptions and all of the inferences that I make from my perceptions? Now Kant is quite aware and says in various places, it's not necessary that you have direct sensory perception of every object in the universe, never mind distant planets or distant galaxies. If you have a microscope, you see, you get perceptions through the microscope of things that you can't see with the naked eye. And once you get into some fancy science, you have theoretical accounts of things which it would be impossible with any microscope or any device to perceive because they are not even perceptible in that way. Now you might say, well, sure, but your story, you, you, you know what you have encountered, and you haven't lived that interesting a life, so you've been a couple of places and you've seen a couple of things, but you know about a lot more than that. I mean, you know about, well, I've been to Australia. I, I actually, it's a nice story. I told you about my son, the chess player. Well, he was playing in the World Junior Chess Championship in Australia, and I, I, I decided to surprise him that I would fly out to Australia to watch him play a game. So I came into my class on Thursday at UMass and said, I'm about to go to Australia, I'll see you on Tuesday. And I set out for Australia. It happened, by the way, I passed through Los Angeles precisely at the moment when, uh, I think it was Lloyd Benson was saying to Dan Quayle, I, I knew Jack Kennedy, he was a friend of mine, you're no, you're no Jack Kennedy. You remember, some of you are old enough to remember that magical moment from that, from that election campaign. At any rate, I happened to be changing planes and stopped at a bar and there, was, there were Benson and Quayle, uh, Quayle on the TV. But anyway, I flew out, I watched my son play the game and I flew back. I got so many frequent flyer points since it happened that the airline was having a triple frequent flyer point promotional that I had enough I had enough frequent flyer points so that I could take my wife for the weekend to Paris and so I came into my class and somewhat later and I said my wife and I are going to Paris for the weekend we'll see you on t I'll see you on Tuesday and one of the students at UMass came up to me and said, here's a half-used carnet of metro tickets you might find it useful. That was the moment at which I knew that UMass was no longer a working class school. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> never mind that. The point is, I haven't been that many places and I haven't seen that many things, but I know a lot about places in the world that I've never been to. But of course I know about them because I've talked to people who are there or I've read books written, purportedly written by people who are there, or I've seen movies of these places. In short, everything comes down to my present perceptions, perceptions that I've actually had. So I really do reconstruct the entire six billion year old vast universe from this little collection of perceptions that I have, plus all the inferences I can make from them. All of us do, if I can for the moment break out of this solipsism that I have put myself in philosophically. Then there's no other way that we could, there's no other way I could know about the world because, as Kant says, if it is not something that I can perceive in space and time, it is, if it is not part of my unity of consciousness, then it is as nothing to me and therefore, as far as I am concerned, does not exist. Only insofar as it comes as it appears in my unity of consciousness, directly or indirectly, can it be a part of the world as I understand it? But, and this is the point of this digression, a part of that world is the phenomenal appearance of myself in the world and the particular set of perceptions which are now understood not only as the material for reconstructing the entire universe, but as also the 
contents of my subjective consciousness, a subjective consciousness which in the world that I have reconstructed starts at a certain point and ends at a certain point. It starts after the world came into existence as I've reconstructed it, and it ends before the end of the world as I've reconstructed it, because why would I have a will if I didn't think there was going to be something around? I'm not one of those people who thinks that the that, that the rapture is coming on Thursday and therefore I needn't worry about it because that's the end of time. I'm one of those, the, one of those skeptics who thinks the world is going to continue, i.e. continue after I, this subjective me, ceases to exist. Okay, this is a fairly weird issue. Now let me move on to the chapter on the schematism of the pure concepts of understanding. Here we get into something very interesting. I want to get through this. I, I see I've taken up so much time talking about this that I don't have much time, but I have enough time to talk about it. Uh, what Kant starts with at, ver at the very beginning of the schematism is the following statement. In all subsumptions of an object under a concept, the representation of the object must be homogeneous with the concept. In other words, the concept must contain something which is represented in the object that is to be subsumed under it. This, in fact, is, meant, is what is meant by the expression, an object is contained under the concept. Thus, the empirical concept of a plate is homogeneous with the pure geometrical concept of a circle. The roundness which is thought in the latter can be intuited in the former. But pure concepts of understanding, being quite heterogeneous from empirical intuitions, and indeed from all possible sensible intuitions, can never be met with in any intuition. This is a problem. How can the categories be applied to the manifold of sensibility if, if they are heterogeneous? Kant's answer. Obviously, this is from the next paragraph. Obviously, there must be some third thing which is homogeneous on the one hand with the category and on the other hand with the appearance, and which thus makes the application of the former to the latter possible. This mediating representation must be pure, that is, void of all empirical content, and yet at the same time, while it must, while it must in, this, in one sense be intellectual, it must in another be sensible. Such a representation is the transcendental schema. And then we get schemata of all the different categories. Now, by this point, if you're reading a critique, you are so confused, and it is so hard, and you're struggling so much to remember all the new terms that you've learned up and to try to follow the argument. And Kant speaks with such authority that this may just pass right by you, but if you stop and think about it for a minute, it's nonsense. It's just sheer nonsense. In order to show you what kind of nonsense it is, let me give you an example. I am delivering these lectures in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And as those of you who know North Carolina may be aware, south of Chapel Hill is a lake called Jordan Lake. I've actually been to it and seen it once or twice. Not much to look at, but I've been there and I've seen it. There are some, I, the last time I was there, some people were fishing. God knows whether they caught anything, but they were fishing. So there's Jordan Lake. Tomorrow, before Alex Campbell has had a chance even to put this lecture up on YouTube, I am flying off to Paris, where I will spend 10 days. And my apartment in Paris is on the left bank, just opposite the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which is the most recognizable object in Paris, leaving aside the Eiffel Tower. It's an iconic place. It's ground, it's ground zero for tourists. It's always flooded with tourists from all over the world. And I want to make a connection between Jordan Lake and Notre Dame, but they seem to have nothing in common with one another. They are utterly heterogeneous. And then it occurs to me, I know, I'll buy a bottle of Baume de Venise. You probably don't know what Baume de Venise is. It's a French red wine, not very expensive. Costs in dollars about 11 or 12 dollars a bottle, which is about my speed of red wine. Uh, there are more expensive red wines, but I can't tell the difference in the taste, so I buy the Baume de Venise, which I like. It's an earthy wine. Never mind whether it has suggestions of fruit and so forth. It's just a nice earthy wine. Now think about it. A bottle of, Bene of Baume de Venise is like the Jordan Lake because they're both liquid. 
On the other hand, the bottle of Baume de Venise is like the Cathedral of Notre Dame because they're both French. So since the Baume de Venise is like Jordan Lake in one respect and like Notre Dame in another respect, I can apply Jordan Lake to the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which will make it very wet because the Jordan Lake is big enough to swallow up Notre Dame. Now that's a nonsense argument, right? I mean, when you put it in those terms, it's a joke. And yet it is what Kant is actually saying. There's something rather weird about Kant's argument. Now what's, what, this is supposed, see this is his answer to a problem that he has created for himself. It's also an answer to a problem that he has himself solved without realizing it at this moment. The problem is he started talking about the categories in the traditional way of 18th century logic as class concepts. And he had a whole table of categories. Remember I put it up, very nice chart, four triads. And those categories, those are the categories which are supposed to be applied to the manifold of sensibility. The manifold of sensibility, which he talks about in the Transcendental Aesthetic, is this diversity of spatial perceptions. Now, since the categories are pure, that is to say they have no sensory content, they have no sensible content, it doesn't seem to be any, in any way possible that the categories could apply to the manifold of sensibility. And so Kant comes up with this cockamamie e explanation of the schematism. But what is the real explanation? Well, the real explanation is lying right in front of our faces, and it is the explanation that he gives us in the subjective deduction. It's why I keep coming back to the subjective deduction as the key to understanding the entire critique. If you understand the categories as rules for doing something, and if you understand the manifold of sensibility as the something that the rules are designed to do something with, then it's not a mystery why the categories apply to the manifold of sensibility. They are just exactly what would apply to a manifold of sensibility because they're rules for reproducing a manifold of sensibility in imagination. That's the real explanation of the relationship between the categories and the manifold of sensibility. But if you think about it, you'll realize that there is a further problem. It is a problem that Kant doesn't solve until the analogies, which is why I keep referring specifically to the second analogy as the place where the argument is going to be brought to a conclusion. Until we understand what the, what the nature of these rules is, we don't understand why, why and how it is that they apply to a manifold of sensibility. Once we try to figure out what their relationship is, we will realize that what we need to do is not first to justify the categories by this hokey derivative derivation of the categories from the table of functions of unity and judgment. What we actually need to do is to focus on the fact that that the mind in, in reflecting on its manifold of sensibility imposes a temporal order on them. And then we need to see whether we can deduce the categories from the nature of time consciousness. If we can deduce the, the categories from the nature of time consciousness, then it will turn out that the categories aren't the first thing that we arrive at in our argument. They are the last thing we arrive at in our argument. It is only when we complete the argument that for the very first time we have an actual a priori argument for the categories. Now, once we do that, we're going to have to chuck some of the categories. We're not going to be able to deduce all of them from the analysis of time consciousness. In fact, strictly speaking, the one that, we'll, that we can deduce most satisfactorily from t the analysis of time consciousness is, not surprisingly, the second of the categories of relation, namely cause and effect. Since it was Hume's critique of cause and effect that got Kant started on this adventure in the first place, it shouldn't surprise us that it is in his defense of the causal maxim that his argument really comes to its right conclusion. And that's what we're going to see next time, when I will take a look at the analytic of principles
I will talk a little bit about the axioms of intuition, a little bit about the postulates of empirical thought, but mostly about the analogies of experience, because that is where the argument is finally going to come to its rightful conclusion. In the next lecture, I will look carefully at those principles, the analytical principles, and I will bring us to the conclusion of the second analogy, which is the most important text after the deduction in the whole book. And in the lecture after that, I will sum everything up by trotting in my easel and my boards, and I will put them up in front of you, and I will go through the argument, pulling everything together that I've said in one single nine-stage, nine-step argument. And at that point, I think, with a few other things I'll have time for in that lecture, these lectures will come to an end. In other words, now that I see the promised land in front of me, I can actually tell you that the totality of, these, of this lecture series will be a series of nine lectures. The last lecture, appropriately enough, will be given the day before the election, which means that on the day that it goes up on YouTube, either things will come out as they should, and I will relax and perhaps even visit you with the second half of the critique, or if they come out as they shouldn't, I will get a one-way ticket to Paris, and you will never see me again. So that's, that's where we are. And with that, I will ask Alex to turn off the camera. Thank you.